Hello everybody, Cone Dodger here. Welcome back to Cone's Garage, doing some more work on the Mark II Supra today. And we're going to start with installing the new rebuilt steering rack, which, as I noticed, pulling it out of the box, has a nice kink in one of the lines on it. So, we're going to go ahead and take our nice shiny new part here and replace this line with a line from the old rack, since it doesn't have a big kink in it. But speaking of lines, we also put on a brand new pressure line. It was one of the things that was on clearance on Rock Auto, so just got it and replaced it. Why not? And now it's time for me to re-shimmy myself down into the engine bay and install the rack with new polyurethane bushings on there as well, which is a nice little upgrade. Should help the steering feel quite a bit. So these bushings that go around the rack, they not only are there to protect the rack and kind of get rid of some of the, the bump feel from the road, but also it helps align the rack in the subframe. Um, these being polyurethane instead of rubber, the bracket on the driver's side just would not line up for some reason. It just seemed like... Now remember from disassembly, this is the one that uh, clips into the subframe, the bottom bolt hole just would not line up correctly and was not really close enough to the subframe. I ended up putting the impact on there and trying to torque it down, but what happened was it just immediately pulled the threads right out of the retained nut in the subframe. So it was a trip to the hardware store to get a new bolt and a nut. Got a nylon locking nut so that this isn't a future problem for us. Uh, and I just drilled the remaining threads out, put this new bolt through there onto the nut, and that gave us enough clamping force to get this thing to tighten down. When dealing with old cars, and especially modifying old cars, this is the kind of stuff I tend to run into a lot. Used to freak me out, and like, oh god, we just stripped the threads of this, it's ruined. Uh, but there's pretty much always a hardware solution for any of this kind of stuff, so I'm pretty confident that this will be a good, long-lasting repair. This is one of those sequences where it looks like I did something in a, in a really quick and easy manner. But in reality, I've fought with these hydraulic lines for 20 minutes because hydraulic lines and hydraulic line fittings, they never want to line up. They never want to thread right. And this is the kind of stuff where if you cross-thread it, well, you're just going to spend the rest of your day trying to figure out a solution there. So uh, it's got to be done right. No, no, don't freak out. I realized that that line was going to interference with the steering rack. But... Once we get everything tightened down, also there's these two clips with bolts that go through them that uh, connect back to the subframe. It keeps the lines in nice order and uh, just straightens everything up. Kind of the, the detail stuff that always really fascinates me with the engineering that goes into cars. But yeah, with those lines tightened down and the clips installed, everything lines up perfectly. And it looks like we should have ourselves one good, smooth operating, and hopefully leak-free power steering system. At this point, I went ahead and called it a night. I think I actually went off and went streaming after that, but uh, Sly went ahead and continued work on the steering rack, installing the tie rod ends, which are now nice and new. Hopefully, with all this new stuff in the steering, the steering is going to be nice and tight and, and have no more slop and old car feel. Centering the steering rack is a little bit of an issue. You know, you need to have the alignment correct so that the steering wheel is in the dead center and you wouldn't be able to turn more one way than the other. Slag apparently did some crazy business with a tape measure and moving it back and forth. Uh, he got it, I think it was only one tooth off on the next day I went outside and, and just, you know, turned the wheel all the way one way and then all the way the other. Uh, and yeah, just one tooth of adjustment and we got it centered. Ah, uh, yes, here's the magical shot of him measuring the tie rod ends to find that they were both even to find the center, or the theoretical center, and it did get us close enough that it was pretty easy to adjust it from there. And now, it's a new day. I actually started doing some grinding and sanding on the windshield frame, and I realized that I should get this thing on the ground and movable, so why not finish the suspension stuff? The only thing left is to do the sway bar bushings and end links. Ah yes, a great time to examine your new parts after you've already started the disassembly. But it looks like these energy suspension end links are exactly what we need. And the award for worst camera shot of the day goes to this one, where apparently I'm disconnecting the D bracket that holds the sway bar bushings in place on the driver's side. Or maybe I was showing how much care I put into not disturbing that spider web. 
and the end link on the other side comes apart, as well as the D bracket, with an actual decent shot of it on the passenger side. So here we go, a decent shot of the whole sway bar, and you can see the D brackets that hold the bushings. This is what holds the sway bar up to the chassis, and you can get a better idea what the sway bar is doing. It's acting as a spring across the car to help prevent the car from rolling or pitching in a turn. Now I need to remove the top nuts of the end links. They provided on the factory ones a nice uh, spot for the wrench to hold on to that made this process nice and easy. Way to go Toyota. On Nissans, they give you an Allen key on the top of it that you can't even use a socket anymore. So screw you Nissan, I hate your end links. And that concludes the disassembly of the end links and sway bar assembly. The sway bar is held in place as it goes through the chassis, but uh, it's uh, pretty much free to roam around at this point, and we are ready to install our new end links. There wasn't a ton of wear on these, they were cracking a little bit, but just really refreshing all of this stuff should help liven this car up on the road. In a mystery box on the shelf, I found these bushings for the sway bar. They are just the factory replacement rubber style ones, but it's nice to put, like, uh, you know, new bushings there. Honestly, the polyurethane ones for this, not that important. And, uh, and replacing them is good. If you ever hear a car that creaks a lot in the turns, that's probably a likely culprit. These things get worn, uh, and it's metal on metal, or... It's just real old rubber against metal. If you're gonna use poly ones here though, make sure you put a little petroleum grease like Vaseline, or I use a uh, plumbing grease, plumbing oil for things like this because polyurethane can be pretty squeaky itself. And I did use that on the steering rack bushings. All right, so now assembly on the end links. If you're watching this and are using this as a guide to do it yourself, uh, fair warning, I get this wrong on the first try. And also, fair warning, when you buy energy suspension end links and such, they're not going to come with instructions. There generally isn't, because these are, for the most part, universal parts. There's just different spacers and different sets of washers that come with each one. I chose the first time around here to go ahead and assemble this in the stacked order that represented what we saw on the factory end links. On the package, it shows just washers around the top and bottom of the two grommets. On the factory one, there's a washer separating the bottom grommet and the lower control arm. So I went ahead and assembled it in the factory way the first time, and I noticed when assembling it, I had to use a jack to actually press it all together in order to get the nut on the top of it. I was able to get it through and able to get the nut to tighten down, but uh, Upon going to the passenger side, I started to put it together in that same order, and I do see the point of the bottom washer, and I, I understand why it was there in the factory setup, but uh, as I'm assembling the passenger side here, I realize that I'm going to be short on washers if I do it this way. I considered using some of the old washers from the factory setup here, uh, but the actual bolt is a different size. I could drill them out and use them, and I bet you it probably would work that way if I had kept those bottom washers on there. I was a little worried about the metal on metal, but it was like that on the factory, so odds are probably not an issue. And to be honest, these McPherson strut setups are so rudimentary, there's so little going on that I doubt it ever would have been an issue. But I think the ultimate solution here is to restack all of this, uh, watch them all tumble down, and try and do it in the way that it shows to do it on the package. There's no instructions, but sometimes pictures are all you need. So back to the driver's side, going to unassemble, disassemble, disassemble this side of it, uh, and just kind of keep placing them all in order, because now I don't have any of these assembled, so I want to make sure I keep everything in order, and just remove the bottom washer, and then restack it all in there, Bushing, washer, spacer, washer, bushing, sway bar, bushing, washer, nut. Did you get all that? You got it? Good, because we're not going over it again. You know what that really reminded me of? Random tangent. The, I think it was like a Super Nintendo game. Maybe it was a regular Nintendo game, but there was like a mat on the floor that you stepped on for the buttons, and the point of the game was to correctly assemble a hamburger with all the ingredients that it told you. What was that game called? Okay, random tangent over. Let's finish these end links.
reassembly of the passenger side. So at this point we have the driver side, end link and D bracket done. The passenger side D bracket is done and we're buttoning up the end link here. And that is one 100% refurbished sway bar setup. I could have cleaned the sway bar. I could have sanded it down and painted it. None of that matters. None of the, the dirt and grime on like the subframe and stuff, none of that matters to us. This is not a this is not a restoration of a car. This is not a car for show. This is a car that we're just trying to make presentable and more worry-free cruisable. One thing I did worry a little about is the fact that there's no torque specs on how to tighten these end links. And again, no instructions. So just a little bit of intuition. I decided to go ahead and jack up on the lower control arm to bring the hub and sway bar assembly to where it would be at rest and tighten it down there instead of at full droop. I'm not sure if that's putting preload on it or not, but it just seemed like the more natural position for it to be tightened at. But that brings us to a point where I can say suspension work is done, wheels can go back on the car uh, for alignment to be done at a much later date. And it's a new day. Well, a new night. This day, this night, we're going to go ahead and remove the rest of the body stuff and the rest of the interior stuff that would be preventing us from getting to the rust repair. The moonroof has been gorilla taped on or gorilla taped shut since, uh, you know, Slag bought this car years ago. It is extremely rusty. It is the rustiest part on this car, I guarantee you. Inside the car, we're going to go ahead and remove the interior panels that would be holding the headliner in place. If we're going to be welding up along that windshield, definitely want the headliner out of there. And since Jonathan works at an interior upholstery shop, he will be refinishing pretty much all of these interior parts. This will probably be one of the, the nicest parts on the car, will be the interior eventually. Whoa, easy there, guy. It's just a sun visor screw. No need to be so concerned. Well, since apparently that sun visor struck so much fear in me, Jonathan's going to go ahead and remove the rear view mirror, which is conveniently held to the roof and not the windshield in this case. Wow, he did it so nonchalantly. You can really tell he does this for a living. All right, all of the handles and accessories on the headliner have been removed. It is ready to come out. Sadly, I did not get a good camera shot of this, but when we first dropped this headliner, massive amounts of leaves and pine needles and such came out of it. And remember that statement. Many leaves, many pine needles stuck in the headliner. That's going to come into play in a little bit here. And now we can get the headliner out of the way. It's in pretty decent shape. It hasn't dropped or fallen or anything, but uh, probably just needs to be reskinned. And now for the process of removing many generations of tape that had sealed up the moonroof. Uh, this is a moonroof car. That means that it is a metal piece that can slide back into the roof to open up uh, to the sunlight, that, that ball in the sky that I've rarely seen anymore. But it, um, it's a little rusty. It's a little rusty. And uh, this Gorilla Tape has done a fantastic job of keeping the water out over the past couple of years. But luckily, the shell that we found, or Jonathan found, has a good moonroof. So we can replace it with actual metal, which is good. Because when you see this thing, you're going to know that there's no way we could have repaired it. Before finding the parts car, the leading theory on how we were going to solve this problem was going to be placing a piece of plexiglass over the top of it. That is an option, but it never looks as good. It always is going to look pretty tacky and, um, I don't know, haphazardly done, even if you do it very well. So I'm happy that we have an actual moonroof to put in here. Even if it probably will never operate, we'll see. We had the motor working, but the moonroof is so rusty that it can't slide because it's gotten uh, warped and misshapen. All right, here we go. Are you ready for this? Are you ready? Are you sure you're ready? Because, oh my god, it's so bad. I don't know how... It's so bad. Maybe with a lot of work and a lot of fabricating, you could save this thing, but uh, I really don't see how. Next up, hatch removal. Now, the hatch on this one is terribly rusty as well. I'm used to rusty hatches. I've had six S13 246s. One of them had a non-rusty hatch. So, 
lucky again. We actually have two unrusty hatches for this car. And the spoiler from it we can put onto the other hatches. I think we have one more of these spoilers too. But it seems as though this spoiler is a main contributor to the rust on the hatch. But it's got to stay because it's, it's such an iconic look. So yes, we're removing the hatch because we're going to replace it, but also we're about to expose the second worst rust area on this car, very similar to the windshield area, and that is the kind of groove around where the hatch bolts on. Not gonna lie, I was a little worried about this hatch removal process as um, I was pretty precariously placed inside the car under this very heavy piece of glass. But luckily, it stays in place pretty well, and we were able to remove it with relative ease, or at least not glass shattered all over me. And pop goes the hose that we forgot for the spray nozzle that sprays down the rear hatch. But that's one of the things that will most likely never work again. Remember the bag and the quarter panel? Yeah, that's not going back. So you remember the leaves? All of this rust around the hatch is caused by leaves getting stuck in here and causing moisture to stay around the hatch. Also mud dauber nests. I find lots of these on old Japanese cars or just old cars in general around Florida. It's a tradition. The good news is this is an area that is non-visible and pretty much non-structural and is going to be a great place for us to learn and practice welding at before we go ahead and tackle that windshield area which is primarily what I spent the rest of my time doing that night, going ahead and taking a flapper wheel on a grinder to start working away at some of the corrosion around the windshield channel. I've been looking at this a lot and trying to figure out how the best way to remove all the corrosion is and also what the best coating is going to be for the corrosion around here. Where the windshield adheres, not a lot of rust holes. So what we really need to know is what your suggestions are to coat it to make sure the corrosion doesn't continue once we weld up the obvious holes. All right, so let's take a moment here to look at our work list. First up, the engine pull is now the engine install. So everything we undid there, we'll have to redo when we go ahead and install the drivetrain. But today we wrapped up the two main things that the engine pull was necessary for, and that is the power steering rack and the sway bar bushings. That includes the lines, the rack bushings, and new end links. Also in there is stuff I forgot to mark off. I already looked at the dizzy cap of the rotor. That all looked good, and we obviously pulled the windshield, but there's still a lot more to do with that. Going through and marking the parts we've already used, which includes the clutch, the main seal, and the sway bar bushings and oil pan gasket. The thermostat and thermostat housing are one thing that needs to be done on the engine before we install. We could do it after, but might as well while it's out here in the open. The radiator has been purchased. Jonathan got a three-row aluminum radiator from a Mark III Supra that will be going into place with some minor modifications to the brackets, as well as some caliper rebuild kits and a rotor for the rear once we get to that point. Uh, the engine install work list, that stuff's going to wait until we have the rust repair done on the windshield frame. But once we get there, it would be nice to get the engine back in just so that we have some garage space. This car is all over the garage now. That'll do it for the progress on the Mark II Super this week. However, we've used the moonroof cover that came out of this car for our permanent patron thanks board. So if you are at the stickers and horsepower level or higher, you too could have your name featured on a rusty piece of metal out of a Toyota Supra. Where else can you get that? Probably nowhere. But thanks as always for watching. I hope you're excited to see the continued progress on the Supra, and we will see you next time.